Check, check. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, today, we're going to be talking about, uh, what are we talking about? Uh, uh, just kidding. That's a good start. What would you like? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're anything. We're kind of open. So we're just going to have a casual panel. We're going to talk about lessons learned, adopting uh, open source and, and, and scaling out um, kind of large-scale clouds. I've got a great panel here, um, folks that are kind of friends and family. We've been working together and been partnered together for a long time. So there's, this is going to be fun. A lot, of, a lot of stories, a lot of lessons learned. Um, but first, I want to kind of introduce the panel and let them introduce themselves just a little bit. Um, we've, got, we've got four folks. We've got Dan, Mark, Sebastian, and Shen. Um, Dan, can you uh, go ahead and introduce yourself, please? You bet. Uh, Dan Sperling over at Getty Images. Uh, for those of you who don't know Getty, Getty is the, uh, I like to say, that the purveyor of pretty much every major either editorial image or a lot of the creative images across the world. Uh, from my perspective, I run what we call our tech services group, which is focused on pretty much everything outside of development uh, for Getty, uh, responsible for all the classic IT infrastructure, help desk, knock, et cetera, as well as all of our application support, and most relevant here, uh, all of our platform and, and cloud efforts. Thank you. And my name is Mark Williams. I'm the uh, CTO at Redapt. Prior to that, uh, two, about three years ago, I was uh, responsible for all of Zynga's infrastructure running all the Farmville games that wasted everybody's time. Uh, so got to ride the wave of building out massive quantities of infrastructure in Z Cloud and uh, the operations team supporting that as well as AWS. Cool. Um, my name is Sebastian Stadel. I'm the founder of Scatter. We do uh, policy and governance uh, across multiple clouds. And um, I have a lot of experience uh, working with uh, um, a lot of enterprise customers that are deploying uh, large hybrid clouds across their um, their private clouds and public cloud infrastructure. Hi, um, hi I'm Shen Liang. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Rancher Labs. Uh, we are, we're, we make a, a Docker management platform, uh, you know, that can run on OpenStack, run on Amazon. Uh, but the, the really the reason I'm here is also we uh, previously I started a company called Cloud.com. Uh, we were uh, actually, I've personally been coming to OpenStack Summit since, since the very first one, uh, uh, summer of uh, 2010, and we made a, a piece of software called CloudStack, and it predated OpenStack just a little bit, and, you know, and so we can kind of tell the story of what, what we learned from there. Yeah, and... Uh, and um, uh, I was a Mark. big user of CloudStack. <laughs> uh, the Z Cloud was, we had two different, uh, two different cloud domains. One was 30,000 nodes, the other was 12,000 nodes, and all with three management servers. So I'm just sharing a little bit of frustration. Now this is my third summit, still hearing how anguishing it is to scale with OpenStack. Um, so I'm looking forward to the maturity of, of that vector. And, and in my role as Redap CTO, you know, I try to be a trusted advisor to our customers who are looking for cloud solutions as they build out their infrastructure. And you know, I, as an operator, as a previous operator, I have to rec you know I can't recommend things that I'm I'm nervous about that will have problems down the road. So, OpenStack has been a challenging one that keeps gaining a little bit of ground, a little bit of ground. So it's it's finally I think getting there. I'm still worried about large scale with it, uh, but again, this is this is all why we're here to talk about what's next. Yep, well, let's get a starting point because you know we have we've got. Uh, Daniel, Mark, that have, have done a lot in that kind of hyperscale area. Um, Sebastian probably has seen the biggest clouds uh, out there and has helped make that deploy. And obviously, Shen has built that software that has done that um, for all these hyperscale deployments. But what, what, what is hyperscale? Kind of what's that definition? And, and, and the second part of that is like, like, does it matter? Like, we're not all going to have hyperscale clouds. So I just, just real quick, like, you know, Mark, what, what, what is hyperscale to you? Like, what is that definition? I think once you start, I mean, there, I, I look at it in two ways. One is the speed at which, with which you are growing, which is really when you're, you're having to solve a different problem of how to, how to grow at that speed. But then there's the, okay, you've, you've reached a certain size. So if I were to pick a number, a thousand nodes, a, a thousand functioning devices feels like a tipping point where you can't, do some of those traditional IT approaches with things that, that have grown to that, that size, like VLANs don't work. Uh, all the, uh, you know, depending on heroic humans to do things to restore service as opposed to depending on automation and repeatability, completely break down at that scale. 
So it, it's really that a, a good inflection point to look at as to how you have to change how you do IT and operations. So, so, um, so I totally agree that growth is a very big component of it. Uh, another big component, I guess, is is how homogeneous your your architecture is. Uh, we work with a big industrial conglomerate that that would qualify as hyperscale in the si in just the size of it, um, but that's across tens of thousands of applications. And so the way you manage that, you, the way you 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 need to you know, govern that and, and just manage it in general is very very different than say a, a, a web scale application. Going off what you said, though, Sebastian, from a standpoint of talking about hyperscale, talking about cloud, those are really great, ambiguous terms. When you talk about the challenges in a single cloud, single application, hyperscale challenge, I see those as very, very different challenges versus, to your point, tens of thousands of applications or even, even multiple hundreds of applications that are inconsistent, uh, incongruent, have different technology platforms underneath them. I, you want to go into a little more detail around the hyperscale challenges that are different in both? Like, because I think that they're very different. Yeah. So, so in in that case, when you have like the hundreds or thousands of, of applications, um, there's going to be a, a widespread of of what those, uh, how those applications are are kept alive, and and basically what their architectural, uh, what their architecture is like. And um, in, in a lot of cases, um, there's going to be some folks that are going to rely on actually the you know, the hypervisor to provide uptime. Uh, for uh, like really old style virtualization um, in that case, so that would be more like you know that might be a hyperscale cloud underneath the the, the cloud APIs, but on top of it, uh, it's not really managed the same way. Yeah, and I think that's the the reason I was asking the question. I think it's important to note, like for for me, when we talk about hyperscale, there is there's a hyperscale around the technology which we've been talking about here, the software and, and hardware that goes under that. But there's also the hyperscale cultural shift that has to come in there. And if you cannot pull people along, you are going to continue to have, quote unquote, hyperscale with a ton of systems and a ton of applications that are managed maybe in more, you said old ways, right? We're old in this context is 10 years, right? That's really old. <laughs> but from the standpoint of you're going to manage it in a different way, the, the needs for consolidation, for some type of consistency, for some config management are there. But the stuff that we're talking about or we're, we're hearing about a lot this week from an OpenStack perspective are probably not versus a hyperscale in a we are building one platform. It is going to grow at tens of thousands of nodes per month and it is going to be highly available and highly reliable with seven people that support the whole thing. Uh, th that's the kind of that hyperscale of a single, single entity, single thing that has the cultural shift of people that are able to think in that kind of context. Yeah, so sure. I, you know, if I add something like to me, uh, you know, hyperscale is actually becoming uh, uh, smaller than most people imagine. Like a lot of before people would say, you know, there are very few Yahoo's, very few Google's, you know, very few Facebook's and it really doesn't matter to us uh, you know, what, what people are doing in, or Zynga, what people are doing in that context. But, but especially with the maturity of a lot of the new development paradigms and you know, container technology, uh, PaaS, uh, just, just the way uh, uh, the development environment has changed so much. It's no longer the traditional middleware, database, uh, three-tier, that kind of architecture anymore. So all of a sudden, um, a new way of, uh, of, of, of developing uh, uh, these applications actually become cheaper to develop applications using following the hyperscale model then you actually have to go back and you know develop an old style app that was not the case uh, just a few years ago so i think uh, you know i think uh, i think hyperscale is going to is going to uh, uh, have a probably a a, a, a a disproportional impact even though in the end very few companies will achieve hy hyperscale in reality but but just like you know, if you build an app, you want to follow good engineering practices. You want to build an efficient app. You want to, you know, even though initially you probably don't really need all that efficiency, you just want to do the right thing. So increasingly, what I'm seeing is, you know, the hyperscale way of building apps and deploying infrastructure, creating, you know, management systems is kind of becoming the norm. And so, just kind of for the for the audience, what's the what are folks kind of here for? Are they are you guys trying to scale applications, trying to scale clouds? Just curious about about the hyperscale and what we've done in the past. Or is anyone trying to scale OpenStack right now in here? A couple people. Okay, that's uh, that's interesting. So what what? Let's talk about some some challenges uh, in that. And, and I'll start with with, with Sebastian and, and some of that you've seen because you have an interesting perspective of of 
helping folks scale both OpenStack and CloudStack, and, and there's some, been some difference, differences and challenges. What, what are some of those things? And are, they, are they technology issues? Are they business issues? Like what, how do you scale these applications for folks? So uh, I'll, I'll use an example. There's actually an upcoming talk uh, in, in the next, uh, next slot um, uh, th that's going to be done by, by NASA. And they have uh, they have a very large uh, radiation simulation cluster um, that where, where the they have this uh, um, um, they're simulating the effects of radiation on some uh, on some shielding that they have, and uh, and it's an embarrassingly parallel process. So what they do is they their scientists they they run that model in their local OpenStack. Um, they run that model a couple of times, and then when they're happy with it, they do like a massive simulation of like two orders of magnitude more particles hitting the shield. Um, and when they're doing that, they, they need to burst to, you know, to the public clouds for all that elasticity. Um, so, so then one of the challenges there is, uh, is you know, even, though, um, like, uh, even though to their developers, their scientists, everything looks uh, homogenous because they're, they're using the, the scalar API to talk to all of that, underneath the hoods, there's, there's very different performance characteristics, very different network performance characteristics and things like that um, for, for the, the clouds that are un underneath. <laughs> Um, so it's, so it, it's kind of a hyperscale type. To, to the NASA scientists, it looks like it's one gigantic cloud. Uh, but, when, uh, but when they're actually trying to optimize things, uh, it, it kind of breaks down a bit. Yeah, yeah if I, you know, um, you know I, one, one example of like challenge of hyperscale, I remember working with Mark's team at Zynger a few years ago, a uh, long time ago. And uh, I think we actually started in 2011. So it's, been, it's really been five years. Uh, since we actually scaled to that, uh, did, did the initial scaling. But one thing we really immediately realized was, you know, like CloudStack back then, we were very proud of the fact that we supported upgrade. You know, OpenStack actually didn't even support yeah. upgrade yet, but we, we said, okay, we support upgrade, and we never really had any problems supporting upgrade, except, you know, until you, then you have tens of thousands of hosts, then you kind of started to realize um, uh, this sort of, uh, the, the, your old, um, uh, Upgrade mechanisms no longer meaningful. So you know these days people talk about blue gray or the red green that that kind of deployment. Yeah, yeah. Or they, they, you 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 have to uh, come up with a you know. So we we was really kind of inventing those back then, inventing those things on the fly. Uh, 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 you know we had to figure out a way maybe to. Uh, isolate a small cluster of servers and just upgrade them first and make sure they really didn't introduce any regression and then and then if something goes wrong we have to roll back and and so so so, so at that time it felt like you remember that's 2011 it felt very cutting edge but 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 now you know you look at it now that's why I said hyperscale is 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 just not what it used to be and uh, uh, um, you know you look at Kubernetes you know all of a sudden and that's kind of how you would upgrade any app in Kubernetes by design, right? And and it made it the process very simple. And and so 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 Rancher adopted that. You know, we we of course are just all into that kind of uh, uh, practices. And I think, uh, uh, you know, I think the, the the you know this this style of upgrade. You know, I, I also remember in the, in the early days, um, we had this. It's, it's challenging to get it right, but it really requires a mindset change. And I had conversations with some of the uh, OpenStack architects in the in the very early days, we we had the Nirvana vision of you know maybe OpenStack never really needs to be upgraded. You always sort of you know you always sort of uh, upgrade little components, and and this stuff is evergreen. You know it's always always good, always alive. So I wish you know I still wish we can we can get there someday, but I I, I think it's possible. Um, that's an interesting point. Uh, w one of our uh, not not a customer but a user of Scalar. Uh, what they do to upgrade from one release of OpenStack to another uh, is that they just plug in another cloud, like a, a, they, they build a, an ice house to replace the Havana that they have, um, and then they just de start deploying new virtual machines there, and through attrition, they, they get rid of the, the, old, the other one. And so they're still running today, uh, they're, I think, still some, a few nodes running Folsom and a few nodes running... Uh, Grizzly and Havana, and, and they kind of just do that th that way. And over time, uh, their developers don't really see what it's running in, and they use attrition to to um, to go get rid of the older stuff. So think, thinking back to 2011 and 2012, while CloudStack did have upgrade in place, you do remember we did <laughs> we had complete outages for some <laughs> surprises. But 
but those were all recoverable, and, and eventually they were all learning exercises to, and, and the key thing is, and kind of tying this back to open source, like because we were running our business on this platform and it wasn't open source, this was a commercial product, like it was absolutely essential to have Shen's phone number to call him in the middle of the night when we were doing maintenance and to deal with these things because, again, we're losing revenue when, when things were down. So, um, and, and just to think too about kind of what that next wave is. You've heard about CoreOS, and CoreOS is like, oh, yeah, we're going to upgrade your operating system pretty much every two weeks. And you might have, and I, it's unclear to me, I haven't researched this in depth, but it's unclear to me how much of a, uh, of a pause button you have on that process because. You can disable it, but having, and this is, this is where the maturity in large-scale operations comes into play. You need to have visibility to all of the things that are changing in your environment. When your customers and your tenants are releasing, when your operating systems are changing, when logging rates change. And so something like a Splunk or the Logstash, Kibana, whole stack with the visibility to all of that is critical to having maturity in operations to know and to ensure that you're effectively lining up air, your, your air traffic control. Only one airplane can land at a time, so you need to, to structure that. So I get a little nervous about having to have a wide, long period to let CoreOS decide to go ahead and, and pivot itself and to look for all the wobbles that are going to occur during that time. Is that the, are you talking about like the change management ITIL sort of things or something else? No, change management for sure. Like okay. the air, air traffic control, you know, give people windows of opportunity, but you have to have visibility and you have to not let people do things at the same time. So I, I'm sensing we're all in agreement that open source doesn't scale and that, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was um, say. No, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about making those decisions. And so you know, there's, there, there's you know, going proprietary, there's going open source, and there's going to kind of go into open source with support. Where, I don't know who, who to ask this. I want to know who's going to take this. But you know, where, where are those lines? Those lines are, well, we have a strategy to go open source. We have a strategy for hitting this, this amount, these requirements. And then where, where is that kind of do-it-yourself, support-it-yourself versus having the uh, kind of the, the, the break this glass and call button. I'll, I'll jump into that. So I look back at, at the four years I was at Zynga as like I was incredibly fortunate with the team that I had and the decisions that we happened to make. There were some early times where we had kind of opted for like no support on, on certain things and when there were complete outages, you know, I'd be the one talking to the CEO saying, okay, well, we're going to fix all these things. But, you know, we, we did choose a lot of early things that were um, open source, so like MySQL and DNS Mask and, you know, CentOS. But you look at a lot of that, well, DNS Mask is kind of off to the side, but like MySQL and CentOS were well established. Like, and, and, and you look at, well, what dependencies are you really building on those? Well, the way Zynga was deploying them is very simple, isolated components that, again, forcing yourself to be religiously consistent with that, building that homogeneity into the environment is absolutely critical because the more proliferation of differences you have and the problem occurs, you don't, there, there's too many variables to eliminate at that scale. Um, but other decisions, because things were going so fast, like DNS mask was a choice made to, to figure out, well, how do we instrument um, you know, DHCP and, and DNS relay in this new, brand new, never been done before large private cloud environment? And right at 1,000 nodes, or maybe 2,000, we hit this bug. And one guy wrote it in the UK, <laughs> and we're like, how do we get support for this? So I was actually just looking at the release notes or the change log this morning, and like my guy had to find it and ask him for a patch, and we paid him a thousand bucks as a thank you. And but that's no, you can't run a business that way. So I get very nervous about people untethered to some kind of commercial support to call the experts, because actually that's why I picked CloudStack, because we looked at CloudStack and Eucalyptus, and the the key differentiator was like feature parity was there, but when we had a problem in our POC. Shen's team was able to jump on it, fix it in 24 hours reliably, and Eucalyptus was like asking me what the problem was the next day. So go with engineering capability is, is a key influencer as well. Dan, so you, you've got a unique business. Um, I just can't, can't even imagine how many new pieces of data you guys are collecting each day and how the random different sizes. What, what's your take on that? What, when do you go? <coughs> 
kind of a supported model and, and when are you comfortable going open yeah. and manage it yourself? You and I were talking about this a little bit before we got started here. I, it's interesting. I, I'll, I came into IT back in the early days. Uh, like my first job, I was actually programming proms uh, for uh, Esprit machines. And so hardcore mainframe. And then you see the shift to distributed. You see then the shift from Novell to NT. You see the shift from, uh, from some commercial applications over to uh, more open source applications. And I think for me, like the, every time I've seen that shift, it's been driven by people. Hmm. So I think that as a, as a leader, like I've had to step back and say, like, am I really fooling myself by saying we are making really strong decisions based on the viability, the supportability, the cost differences, et cetera? Or am I making that decision based on the people? And I, for because uh, because of some experience I've had, I've seen more and more that it's a people side. I I was at J.P. Morgan and T-Mobile, and we were hardcore commercial. We stayed commercial. We we absolutely preached we will not risk our business uh, on something that we do not have a good backstop with. A good backstop being a good partner. At going over to Getty though, Getty to your point, like we ingest a few hundred thousand images a day. Those images are ingested from, like we have people that were working uh, in uh, Africa on some of the, uh, from a disease perspective on some of the challenges they were having there uh, as a country, oh, sorry, as a world. And they were like getting its images back over into AP, for example, in like five minutes. So we could give real time information around what was going on. Uh, so at that, at that state, if you're trying to, if you committed to your partners, I'm gonna get images to you in five minutes, like actually from somewhere in, in, uh, in the jungle, I'm gonna also have those images stored perpetually. So uh, it's, it's obviously uh, sad, but when Philip Seymour Hoffman passed away, uh, we, we had a lot of pictures that we had never ever viewed that were needed within seconds. Like literally within about 20 seconds, we had images that had not been touched in, uh, in 20, in, sorry, in about 15 years. So from that standpoint, like how do you keep all that stuff available and how do you have a backstop that says, if something breaks, how do I immediately get support? I came into that group with that commercial mindset because that's what I had come from, but the team members that I had in the organization, like the really strong team members who were leaders from a technical thought perspective were hardcore open source. And they were able to show me and really tr kind of sway me to say, hold on a second, there's a different view, the community can support us, and then when we need it, we can actually have kind of that backstop through partners that are able to give secondary support outside the community, and we can get as good, if not better, support from an open source solution as we do from commercial software. Now, I know that sounds like blasphemy to Oracle and Cisco and EMC and HP and IBM, but it's interesting, we've seen that in truth. But we've had to build a house that way. We've had to build a house around solutions that probably aren't built by one person, right? We've, we've consciously made decisions that are things at a point of, uh, at a point of, uh, I'll say, uh, a maturity that we can actually build our house on those solutions. Uh, people are joking, like I've, I've not heard, I've heard the tagline already, like give me liberty or give me death, right? From the standpoint of, it's gonna be interesting to see how much more liberty brings in ease of deployment, uh, ease of scalability, ease of support, et cetera, and then also some of that higher availability it needs. And I think that we'll see adoption continue to ramp based on that maturity, but also really based on the people that are driving it within the companies. So um, if I can just uh, tag on to that. <clears throat> Uh, asking you a question. Uh, when you say commercial software, do you mean like a like a commercial license for, to an op open source software or proprietary? Yeah, that's a good good call. I, I think that the question, I'm going to twist it a little bit and say the reason typically why we choose commercial software, open source supported and or truly commercial, uh, is because we need the support. It's a support decision, not so much a uh, not so much like a, a, a go to market strategy for the vendor, whoever it is. Yeah. And, but coming back, it really also, I, I want to reiterate though, I and mean, we talked a lot about that support side, it was, I am, I have got three principal engineers and they love name your thing, right? They love Docker. Uh, and so the larger challenge we have there is not so much around like saying, should we or should we not move forward with Docker? It's more around saying those three principal engineers who are absolutely on the bleeding edge that are trying to move forward with Docker today that are completely upsetting the Apple cart for all of our like puppet users, right? Who are like, no, config manage everything, right? No, no, Docker everything now. Like, we're not doing config management anymore. We're doing Docker now. Like that, that life cycle for some of our principal engineers is like three to six months of change. Like we are Docker. No, we're gonna go Kubernetes. No, we're, now we're changing that all and we're gonna strategize on something completely different. We're gonna do something like completely off the shelf with Magnum and then some type of new container solution. Like the challenge we're having is they're moving so quickly that we cannot bring our people along like the rest of the organization. The, you know, the two percent are there and we can't bring the rest of the organization. And so we're really having to like kind of slow down and pick the right solution 
to your point, based around the supportability of that thing, but also based on what our, our, our culture can absorb, that, that speed wanna, of change. I want to talk some more about, about people and open source and scaling. But first, um, is, are there any, any questions from the audience so far? So we're, uh, can, can, do you mind hitting the microphone? Or? Yeah. yeah. Sure. So um, in talking about hyperscale, and especially talking about OpenStack, OpenStack is mostly a control plane which provides access through plugins and extensions to a back plane, which is the data plane, which is traditionally provided either through some open source reference implementation or some third party vendor. We saw yesterday in the keynote that there's 60 different storage plugin drivers, there's 30 different network plugin drivers, there's multiple different hypervisors, and when you factor that out, there's more than a thousand different permutations of OpenStack. So the, real, the, real, the reality to me, and I'd like to know from you, is do you think OpenStack is limitations for scaling is on the control plane and is it an application or systems architecture problem, or is it an integration problem and in not being able to properly test scaling across all those different permutations? That's such a great question. Thank you. I'll take a stab at that. Um, so I think there's a lot of different answers to it. One is, you know, looking at what OpenStack has kind of started being, it's, it's like an SDK. It's, and, it's, and its intent is to try to far -reaching, have a far-reaching uh, ability to do everything. And I think that lack of focus leaves people vulnerable to things that are tried and true. So there are, in this world, there are so few kind of well-traveled paths that have demonstrated that repeatability. Like everybody's doing larger scale or HA kind of in a different way. And so how can you learn from each other? And I think the other kind of vulnerability is to, is to the customer that is believing this idea that OpenStack is able, you know, when they say there's support for XYZ component, they're led to believe that it's the full integrated support, like everything I can do natively with that device or that OEM or proprietary device is supported through the OpenStack API now. Great. Yeah. And then you find out that it's like you can do one thing and not very well. Um, and so that's where I kind of get to what is the approach? And, and this, this doesn't directly answer your question, but like when we talk to customers about what are you trying to solve with OpenStack or with a cloud solution, the question really is, what is your workload? And so many of the customers can't articulate that. They just want to be on the bandwagon and have one or have the Amazon-like thing. And like, well, that's not really a good strategy because it's not going to save you money. It's got to be, you know, the, the, the successful clouds I've built and have, have helped customers build and I see customers build is there's a purpose to it and it's going to solve this particular problem. And there is a religious focus about keeping things simple. And that's why cloud scaling was so fantastic for me because you guys forced customers to adopt something that was utilitarian. And it was utilitarian for a reason, is because simplicity scales. I, mean, I, wanna, uh, I wanna just add something. I think Sean actually asked a really uh, important question in my mind, and it's not obvious to, to, to a lot of people what scalability really means. And basically, there's control plane scalability, as you said, just about managing number of nodes and managing number of VMs. And then there's scalability about like this whole interoperability mess. There's so many combinations you're gonna also have to worry about. I, I personally actually believe the second one is a lot more serious than the first one. You know, the, I remember I had a conversation with, uh, with, with Mark Shuttleworth, it was a long time ago. We were, you know, it was before OpenStack, we were still talking about doing cloud stack and, and he kind of said, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't you have a scalability problem if uh, you were using, because we were using MySQL to store some, some, some data and he's like, shouldn't you consider using a NoSQL database? I said, why? He said, because it's more scalable because, you know, because, because Facebook uses it and it makes sense. But, 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 but then on the other hand, Facebook is managing hundreds of millions of of users, right? Each doing things would be billions, tens of billions of messages. Whereas we're, I mean, we're in the best case talking about managers a million VMs, and you know, that's <laughs> so. So it's like we're talking about three orders of magnitude from where Facebook is going to be. You know, are you sure you you, you want to deal with that kind of complexity for that? So I actually think the control plane scalability is also kind of been blown out of a little bit blown out of proportion. But the, it's really the interoperability scalability that that's kind of in many ways is taking a toll on. The, on a project, and and I mean personally, if I, I wish like some of the original um, uh, 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 
sort of so the description of OpenStack was so good that we you know that's why we you know, despite back then that they was developing a competing product. We honestly thought in like nine months, in 2000, 2010, we would have switched over to OpenStack and throw away all of our code. It didn't happen because you know, the code wasn't there. But, 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 but one of the things that really attracted me was uh, this idea there's gonna be a, was gonna be an independent, loosely coupled set of <laughs> components that you can pick and choose as, uh, as you wish, and they could be independently tested and I thought that would really solve some of the, you know, some of the interoperability testing problem as well. And and that I, I you know, I, now I see it in the Docker world. You see, you see, um, uh, people. I mean, that's why Go as a programming language is taking off because it's so simple. And if you if you ever write a million lines of Go, it will be unmaintainable. But but if you write, you know, if you write a few thousand lines of Go, it's it's very clean. So it almost forces you to decompose your problem into, into, into smaller chunks, and, and each of them is basically independent, right? And, 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 and that way you, you, you sort of convert a M times N problem to sort of M plus N problem, basically at, at the end of the day you can test each one of them independently. So you know, I, wish, I wish OpenStack could be more like that, and I think that would be make it a lot easier to adopt and, and scale. I think that the problem too is Python. Like it's an interpreted language. Like you're not going to get scale of performance out of that. That's one of those fundamental things. I think we have another question over here. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. I join the session later. I'm sorry if uh, this was answered. Can you speak to the um, supported hard supported or certified hardware? How important that is? Uh, yes. So I'm going to put this in the context of. The cloud maturity model, I don't know if any of you have heard of this, but the Open Data Center Alliance cloud maturity model actually describes what steps are logical to take as you grow from having zero cloud to having a fully optimized, well-running cloud. And early in that process, you're, you're needing to focus on just successful, you know, proof of concept, basic capabilities, and as this relates to like the hardware compatibility list, so many customers want to start with like old hardware or just random things that they have in their closet or go directly to like the cheapest ODM manufacturers to start off these kinds of projects. And so deviating from the HCL of a vendor or a recommendation or deviating from what you already know well, like the most valuable things for the way we approach things at Zynga is like, let's not change everything at once. Let's, let's build on things that are reliable because we don't have, and this was all based on not having time to distract ourselves with new problems. Let's build on the backbone of what we have known and trusted. And I made mistakes through that process. Like I went into the blade chassis world. This is pre-cloud, but I you know, went into blade chassis thinking this was gonna help optimize our power in the data center. And it just blew up in our face because it just added so much newness and complexity and software. And you know, I wanted to just, I, and we finally threw it out. It was like the happiest day of my life. And um, <laughs> so, again, my, my general recommendation is is build on the backbone of what you know. Leverage the domain knowledge and vendor dis, vendor um, um, kind of experiences that you have. Work on things outside of the rack, like figure out how to innovate the cloud solution with how you do operations, how you do authentication, how you do logging, how you do monitoring, how you do change management. Keep things simple inside. Then once you've learned how to do that, then you can start optimizing. Then you can go to ODM. Then you can go um, you know, figure out how to manage all those differences. I, I would add, though, that I think that I, well, if the Google outage the other day taught us anything, that there is some need around making sure that we're safe uh, from a from an HCL perspective. But at the same time, it it is kind of tied to your problem. You you were talking about it in a production at scale. If you're trying something new or you're trying out, to, trying to figure out where you're going to land, maybe you do want to play a little bit with different hardware. Maybe you want to carve out. I don't know what the amount of time is, uh, but maybe you want to carve out a little bit to think about optimizing in parallel. Uh, I mean, for us, I know that we. We, to your point, we are trying to get consistent and standard and make it as plain and simple as we possibly can. But there are some places where we're trying to also in parallel optimize uh, without completely saying we're going to wait until we get the, the, the uh, surrounding systems, the donut around the hardware clean. So uh, he here's a little story that, that, uh, that kind of this reminds me of. And it provides a little bit of background. So I'm sure a lot of uh, a lot of the people in the audience have heard about Nebula, the, the company that recently went under. Uh, one of the, imp the the impetus why Chris Kemp went out and 
and wanted to design a, uh, an appliance is because back when he was at NASA, uh, at, at Ames, uh, he was building a eucalyptus cloud for, for the federal government. And one of the pro problems he had is even though he had procured uh, hardware from you know, a bunch of hardware from from a vendor. It turns out that they had uh, like 40 percent of the fleet uh, that that had this, you know, serious hypervisor issues, and uh, it took them months to figure out what the issue was. Is even even though the the boards were the si same and the firm were the same and everything was the si same, it turns out that the the OEM of the board was sourcing a specific chip from two different vendors, 60% from one vendor and 40% from another vendor. And that is an extremely hard problem to, to dig down and find out exactly what, what that issue is. So even if you're like, th there's that, that's the other case, even if you are sourcing all your hardware from one single vendor, the, you know, there's still some, there might still be some variability there. And so that, that experience is what led him to then create the company, et cetera, et cetera. We had a question. <laughs> Can you guys speak a little bit about the process of transitioning from a more commercial model to a more open model from a people process and applications perspective? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll take a first crack. I, it's, uh, it's been interesting, uh, I'll, I'll be honest. It, the more that we have tried to make that transition, the more we recognize that there are fundamental things. Uh, it kind of goes to what Mark was saying, like, do you know why you're building your cloud? Uh, stepping back a little bit even from that and extrapolating from that idea, do you know why you're trying to make that people transition? Uh, and as we've looked at it, uh, both when I was at T-Mobile and at Getty, the, the thing that I think resonated the most was we had too many people who were network engineers that literally said, I am a route switch engineer, I am a load balancer engineer, I am a whatever, and I know nothing about the application. I just simply uh, respond with whatever the request is and I do the thing that the request asks for. Same on our hardware guys, same on the team that was driving our storage platforms, same on the teams that were driving our database engineer, et cetera. They were doing the thing that they were asked to, and, but they were, they were not applying their expertise to the application stack that, or the actual business problem that that application stack solved. They were applying their expertise to their expertise. So w the maturity in our, our business did not gain a lot of value out of that, but maybe the maturity in that one platform was rock solid because they were, that's all they were focused on. That led, though, to we would solve problems, for example, delivery or velocity problems. We would solve problems by saying, we're going to optimize how quick we get the form, the firewall form, right? Use that example. How quick we get the firewall form from the customer to the person, and the person fulfills that firewall form in a day, and we've got an SLA, and we wrap it all in, in a lot of garbage, candidly. And then, but nothing actually helped the app. So then we step back and you look at that problem and say, what is the real problem? The real problem is we don't understand why we're doing this technology thing we're doing. We don't understand why we're applying this, the, our expertise or our knowledge to whatever the business problem that we're solving. And so that transition and transformation for us has started with, do our employees understand what our business is? Do they understand what our business is trying to accomplish? Do they understand why we're doing, why, you, why are they a DBA at, the, at Getty? Uh, why are they a network engineer at Getty? And then can they take that and then transform and say, now that I know what the problem is, I can figure out how to help solve that problem. So for example, if your problem is your marketing team wants to try new ideas out and do A-B testing on a really rapid basis, but that does sometimes require like the, the, the proverbial firewall rule or whatever the other thing is, and you tell your marketing team to try that out through technology is going to take about two months, right? They are going to weed out 90% of the things they want to try out and to get down to the 10% that they want to try because they know it's going to take so long, it's not worth it to try all of them. If, if you as an engineer know that, and you're like, hey, how can I be way faster at just trying something out? They don't, they don't need it to be perfect. They don't need it to be uh, completely rock solid. They just want to try it out with 5% of our customer base. Okay, well then I can probably do these three things, whatever, and I can go and talk to Steve and Mary and Nancy over here, and we can figure out how to, if, across the four of us, in our domain expertise, solve this problem. Then all of a sudden, now you're looking at solutioning for a business problem, not solution on how fast you can answer a ticket. Once you start solutioning for a business problem, that's when you really start going into, how do I, what do I use? I, well, I, I'm probably going to have to use something that's faster than, I, and I'm not knocking on Microsoft with this at all, but I'm probably going to have to use something that's faster than installing Microsoft from a CD or DVD, right? And, uh, sorry, Windows, and then building up an environment. I'm probably going to have to look at config management. I'm probably gonna have to look at something faster than actually building up a machine every time and look at containerization. I'm probably gonna have to look at something that's faster than, even faster than a, a, uh, 
a like a actual like graphical interface where I can provision servers and actually start using an API solution. And then it that transformation forces you to change and look at technologies that are able to uh, better enable that that higher level of velocity. Really long answer, but hopefully that gets you there. I'll try to follow that with with a maybe shorter one. Um, objectives is a way to align kind of organizations and businesses. So what worked really well for us at Zynga was operations shared an objective for availability of games, no matter what the cause was. It wasn't like, oh, our network was up 100%, but the game's down. Like we considered everything all in because we're all in this together. User experience matters. So measuring object measuring availability, even if Facebook was down and it caused an outage for us, we measured that because it matters. Second one was cost. Third one was the speed of delivery for new environments. And uh, the fourth one was good, fast, cheap. Uh, what was the other one? Anyway, you, you, awesome. you, you, you get it. Yeah, awesome. Uh, innovation. I, uh, availability, right, so cost. Anyway. We're, we're about time. We're one, one, lightning round. Just one last question. Uh, it, you're building your cloud. You know it's going to scale. Open source, do it yourself, or or some sort of supported open source. Jen, oh, definitely, I'll do I'll do supported open source because I think our value add probably should be focused on adding things on top of you know some of the work other people have already done. Right. Sebastian, so uh, um, so uh, a very short story. Um, I absolutely hate it when somebody in my organization you know, creates a little bit of app, so some application or something like that. Uh, or brings in something into the company and then starts working on something else because that becomes a liability to me. So I really, really like it when, when the, my team chooses co like either commercial software or proprietary open source. So that like with, regardless of what project the person is working on, I know I can rely on some vendor for it. Good, fast, first, buy something, then figure out how to optimize and make it cheaper later. Yeah, uh, very much commercial uh, proprietary for the brownfield and then some type of supported open source for the Greenfield. Thank you guys so much. Uh, it's been a great panel. I appreciate everyone for, for, for coming. And um, yeah, we'll see you around. Thank you, Jeff, for moderating. Yeah. Thank you.